Welcome to the Yang Gang Roundtable. We are a basic income advocacy podcast. It is Friday, July 24th, 2020, and we are fortunate enough to have uh, three members of Basic Income UK here with us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves now, if you would please. Okay. Um, my name is Barb Jacobson. Uh, I basically, well, I coordinate Basic Income UK and um, have been doing this since 2013. Uh, there was a European Citizens Initiative about basic income, which we formed to support. And uh, we've been going from there. Uh, there are also, there's also the UBI Lab Network, which has been forming uh, more local groups and uh, the Basic Income Conversation, which has been coordinating research and some of the political, some of the kind of national political activity about this. Maggie? Okay, uh, my name is Maggie Gordon-Walker. I'm part of the fairly newly formed Basic Income Southeast. Our objective being particularly to get a, a basic income trial in Brighton and Hove. So we have a petition that was due to be debated yesterday, but it's been held over to October. Uh, yeah, it's I think the eighth, eighth or maybe now ninth city in the UK to call for a basic income trial obviously we would like to just introduce basic income but it may be that we have to jump through these hoops first i also head up an organization called mothers uncovered which supports mums uh, to get used to their new life as as an, as parents and a lot of them struggle considerably with uh, you know what they're going through and i think a basic income would be really beneficial for them Yeah, hi, my name is Martin Osborne. Um, I am also in Brighton and Hove, and I'm actually uh, on the City Council in Brighton and Hove. Um, and yeah, so with Maggie and with a few others, we co-founded the Basic Income Southeast Group. Um, so we're pushing for that trial, but we will hopefully be pushing for other trials in the southeast of England as well. Um, so yeah, my aim sort of as part of the group was to be working with them advising them about the council about how we can get things through into local government so we had a petition that we started and as maggie said it was going to be debated yesterday but we will um we will fully debate it um in october as because there's been the delay uh, but hopefully we think that it will pass um and then other sort of things that i'm involved in i'm also sort of involved with the green party so that's the party that i um represent as a councillor in brighton and hove and i'm also so i'm also on the, the working group um, that was working on the proposal that we had for last year's uh, manifesto. So the 2019 manifesto for the general election, we had the sort of first fully costed um, proposal in any of the UK parties uh, for, for basic income. So I was part of the group that was working on that as well. All right. And uh, before we move on, uh, Richard is about to join us here. Oh, good, good. All right. Well, um, before Richard joins us, uh, we'll introduce ourselves to you. Uh, fantastic to meet you all. Uh, my name is Shale Riley. I am the founder, one of the producers of the show. And, um, you know, I do, do the editing, some of the technical stuff. Um, uh, we have Ariel, who's been with us from the very, very beginning. Uh, why don't we, Ariel, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So, my, Jeremy. sure. My name is yeah. Ariel, and I'm the one who invited you all here. Uh, great to have you. And uh, I have a YouTube channel called uh, Revolutionary Thinking, which I think it's funny because, like, it, ironically, the, the, the U.S. was founded through a revolution between <laughs> England, oh, yeah. but, like, we've, we've completely lost our way. Yeah. Now I think we need like a new revolution of not like, you know, fight fighting against the tyranny of like ignorance. And I think that uh, universal basic income is part of that revolution, like a financial revolution to unshackle people from financial chains. But I was thinking, and, and also like a revolution in the way our, our education system is going on. And I think worldwide, because the world has changed so much. And uh, I have a Twitter, Ariel's underscore Armada. And also I, I love things that fly like drones and helicopters and planes. So I have an Instagram called Ariel's underscore Ariel's. 
That's A R I E L S underscore A E R I A L S. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, so, uh, Faye. Hi. Oh, hi. Welcome. Faye Koo is here. Are, are you talking to Faye Doni or Faye Koo? Uh, I was talking to Faye Doni, but I realize that you're here now. You weren't showing, you just showed up for me. Zoom. Go ahead, other Faye. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, you guys introduce yourselves, please. Yeah. I, I'm the other other Faye. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I actually am in East Texas Arboretum right now, which is in Athens, Texas. It was about a 40 minute drive from my home in Palestine, Texas. And that's where you'll find me at Twitter on Twitter at Palestine Math, P A L E S T I N E M A T H. So my name is Faye uh, uh, as well, Faye Downey. And um, my Twitter handle is at Tisdoney, T I S D O N E Y. We, we do this, we introduce our handles. Um, but yeah, I would say um, I'm just trying to work on as many different things to help. Uh, find actionable items for our country to move forward. Uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on consent culture, which we lack a lot of. Um, and uh, I've been a, a nomadic activist. Um, so I've been traveling in the U.S. for about a year and a half. Um, and I've really seen a lot of things on the ground level. Uh, you know, um, I pick up trash while I travel. I let some people sleep in my truck sometimes if they have nowhere to go. Uh, you know, just trying to show humanity first, proof of concept kind of thing. So, but yeah. <laughs> May I also introduce uh, this person who's uh, walking around with me, who's also Yang Game with us? Sure. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Sure, go ahead. Hi, my friend. I'm Daniel Arizon, and I'm with the uh, USA Jobs Factory on Twitter and uh, AmericanJobsFactory.com, uh, creating the greatest American business ever. Oh, we know and you. Yeah. Yeah. That works for us. We know you. You've been on the show. Good to yeah, see yeah. you. Yeah. Dan Daniel drove out from Fort Worth, which is like a, like a three hour drive. Yeah. That's where one of the I guys in my music group is. Awesome. Fort Worth. That's crazy. Hello. My name is Angelo. I'm a UBI activist here in Arizona. I sit on the board with the Humanity Forward Arizona. I'm also a member of the National Yang Gang board, now named. Uh, humanity first movement my, you can find me on twitter at hellion hellfire my old um musical stage name we still have sheridan and then uh richard has just joined us so welcome richard uh we'll have you introduce yourself after sheridan if sheridan is with us oh i am i was just uh, all right giving you your time Sheridan. Thank i never so know much. because your camera's off thank you <laughs> <laughs> yes unfortunately i don't have a great camera um, but I am Sheridan, hailing from New Mexico, great state of New Mexico. I'm a small business owner who has been unfortunately shackled with the current crisis, and a basic income would definitely fix almost every problem. <laughs> so it's definitely crucial here in New Mexico. Thank you, Sheridan. And uh, welcome to the show, Richard. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Richard Hi. I'm part of the board for Basic Income UK, uh, one of the founder members of Basic Income Southeast, um, who, along with uh, Maggie Gordon Walker and Martin Osborne, who are also on the call, um, we've set up a petition uh, calling on Brighton Council, City Council, to uh, run uh, a basic income pilot in the city, and that will be debated at the full council meeting in October. I, I'm just here as an observer, actually, really. Um, so Maggie and Martin, I think you're going to, and Barb are going to kind of carry this conversation for us. But thank you. Well, thank you for being here. I mean, and uh, you know, the more the merrier. I'm sure you have more to contribute than you say. But well, uh... <laughs> I'm just about to go for my tea. <laughs> We're just ordinary people who believe that hey, basic too. income is some is a right that everyone should have you know we're when there's there's we're all just very unpretentious here so thank you for joining us um oh, hey, oh. Hey, if i could jump in my yeah. name is jeremy oh uh, jeremy I'm a, gosh I'm, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm a ubi activist yeah. in uh, just south of st louis missouri uh i'm the co-producer of this show and uh the co-founder of uh restoring american families pack uh, we are a uh, a pack a political action committee focused on supporting conservatives running on a UBI platform. Thank you, Jeremy. Nice always, to meet you, Jeremy. Always give somebody. <laughs> so, so with, uh, with that all out of the way, we are, we are all introduced. Um, I'm just going to open the floor for discussion. Let's, 
let's talk about our different UBI advocacy styles, communities, and beliefs. So, um, just first of all, I wanted to say how amazing it is to to watch the you know, the Andrew Yang movement grow and the basic you know, and with that, the basic income movement, and to see so many people from all over the United States. You know that it's not just yeah. Uh, my That's dad cool. was uh, my dad was in New Mexico. Um, I'm from Ohio. Mainly, um, I was born in California near Berkeley, um, and I lived in near Washington, D.C., and I also spent some time in uh, New Hampshire and, and in uh, Boston. So, yeah, no, it's a real thrill, actually, to, to see some you know, people from so many different places on the call, for sure. It's very heartening to see people from all over the world that know who Andrew Yang is and hold him in high esteem, because he's definitely, obviously, we wouldn't be here without him. He's the focal point that rallied us all together. And though he did not win the 2020, uh, you know, presidential nomination, he has had an impact that will be more lasting than probably the person who did. So we're here for that. So thank you, Andrew Yang, if you happen to hear this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, so we've, I mean, as I said, we've been uh, going at Basic Income UK since since 2013, but uh, really in the last sort of, I guess, six months? You know, how long has it been? <laughs> I'm really excited to lose track of time. Time is um, a funny thing this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so there have been, I think, uh, probably about 12 new local groups set up or more than that, 16, I don't know. Um, and then we're also just starting to organize uh, by sector. So uh, UBI Lab Women uh, will be having their launch meeting next next week on Wednesday and UBI Lab Youth has launched. Um, yeah, and so there'll be other, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be other UBI Labs forming and also uh, basic income groups. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, plus we have, I mean, I think the other thing that's actually really helped us this year is that uh, there's a new initiative called the Basic Income Conversation, which has been formed through a, a progressive think tank called Compass. Um, and they've been working very hard to kind of coordinate um, academic research about basic income and also uh, the this kind of surging interest by national politicians uh, in basic income and try to sort of see if that can be kind of coordinated into some kind of action in parliament. Um, so yeah, so that's that's been kind of a very quick precy of our story in the last sort of few months. Um, yeah, and, just picking up, oh, sorry, I need to finish. Go for it, go no, for it. I was it. just going to say, so picking up what Bob said, it's what, maybe five months, I think, since mm-hmm. lockdown in the UK. So we had planned a, a sort of a, a launch for Basic Income Southeast in Brighton towards the end of March. Now, I can I know for a fact, because I've organised many events, that we would have probably struggled, I think Martin will back me up here, to get more than about 20 people in the room, I would think, because there's so many other things to do. But because it moved online, it then was recorded and then it becomes a, a, a public record for other people to see. And at the same time, there was a massive explosion in all the activists from all around the UK coming together in different groups. And as Bob said, you know, a massive amount of political interest. So we had Rishi Sunak, our councillor, kind of rebuffing the petition that had well, 100,000 at least signatures. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that, that didn't stop us. There's kind of more and more each week. There's somebody else has written an article or there's another petition or boom, 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 boom. And it's like people are not letting this go away. And sort of various uh, people in the public eye that we know in the UK kind of keep coming forward to support it. And the movement's just getting bigger as far as I can see. No, the government keeps having to answer questions about basic income, all right? So it's, you know, if it's not, if it wasn't the original emergency basic income thing, then now it's uh, the uh, the Scottish government has come out with a feasibility study about doing four pilots in Scotland. Um, that's being pushed. Uh, the Scottish National Party uh, carries on asking questions. And recently the um, Department of Work and Pensions Committee in Parliament uh, did a consultation as, uh, asking, which included, it was supposed to be about the future of work, but then they included questions about basic income. And this is after only two years ago, they dismissed it out of hand. So yeah, so it's been quite an exciting time. 
how do you guys um, reach the most uh, amount of viewers or, you know, like reach the mo most amount of people? Because I feel like we struggle getting our message out here in America. Like, what's your guys' strategy? You've been doing it a lot longer. Uh, I wish I could say that there was like an amazing strategy that we worked mm -hmm. out, you know, in a back room over, you know, with smoke and mirrors and whatnot. Um, <laughs> it's really just been kind of anarchy in the UK, really. Um, you know, these groups have popped up. Uh, they've been pressing their local politicians. Um, we've been, yeah, uh, you know, recently there was a really great letter that came out by, um, you know, from the Musicians Union and various other artists. And right before that, uh, the group Massive Attack released a video uh, with a uh, guy standing speaking, which was really, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's been really amazing. So we've just kind of managed just through our own energy. And um, and it also actually, I have to say, it's really helped having a few people in around the country who are actually, you know, paid some money to do this work, you know, that it's not been totally rely reliant on volunteers. Um, obviously, we have a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of voluntary effort, but um, I just feel like we've been kind of turbocharged by the fact that, you know, we've got like one full time and about three or four part time people who, you know, who do get some money to do this work and are, not you know, we're not just simply reliant on volunteers and people just kind of picking up time in between things. So, yeah, so that's been, again, not really so much a strategy, but just kind of the circumstances that we've been in. You know? Twitter, though, I would say is probably the most immediate and yeah. obviously the UK being so much smaller, uh, you kind of feel you've got a handle on everyone in the UK via Twitter. If you were all doing your Twitter handles earlier, I'm M Gordon Walker. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I don't know, Martin, what do you think? What's the best way? Um, I think that the issue is, is that the people who will benefit the most from the basic income are the ones that are probably least, um, have least capacity to engage. Yeah. So it's probably yep. about going towards them communities and really using sort of community organizing skills. Um, so ideally you would have community organizers that would be going around the country. So I would be interested to hear from, from Faye Doney there about going around the country and exploring um, and meeting people because I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, and in terms of the basic income conversation, uh, they were trying to collect stories and then basically use them stories. So it's not all about this of the economic affordability and uh, asking technical questions. It's more about um, what would you do with the money if you had it? How would that change your life? Um, and I think compiling all them stories is a, is a, and more sort of effectively case studies is a, is a more effective way of really reaching people's hearts as well as their heads. Um, so I would think that that would be the best way to do it. But how can we really get out to communities? And it's been very, very difficult during lockdown to actually talk to people. Um, again, the people who need it the most often the ones that are digitally excluded as well. So they mightn't be able to afford a, a good Wi-Fi connection and be able to come online. So it's, uh, it's I think that the strategy going, going for, uh, forward is really need to be how can we reach those that need it the most? I think Martin, so, you're absolutely right. Oh. So and I was just going to say as well that there's a perception. It's the same with you if you're doing anything to do with the environment. It's seen as being a middle class issue, even though obviously we all live on the planet. So it's everybody's issue. It's the same thing. As Martin said, the people that need it the most are probably suspicious of the people who are working for it. It's kind of do good and do good and middle class people. And it's not for the likes of them. It's just like, yes, it is. It's entirely for the likes of you. It's you're the ones that are going to benefit the most. But it's very hard trying to engage. As Marty said, I mean, I just anecdotally had a conversation with a woman from a very deprived area here in Brighton. And when I just chatted to her, because I know her, she could understand it. But I think if, if she'd received something through the post or seen a, you know, something online, she, that wouldn't have appealed to her in the way that me, who knew her, talking to her did. You know, I, I would say uh, <laughs> being on the ground level, um, I've been doing a lot of investigation uh, into the problems and like I've interacted with countless people who are on the streets you know like a lot of people it's it's a lot um, but you know I also met women in women's shelters and stuff and uh, it, like just 
talking to them at that level has been helpful, but they're so over with trying to take care of their basic needs that they can't even think about anything related to this, you know? So it's like, we, we, it's good for them to hear about it, but I don't even know if they'll vote, you know, because they don't even have the mental capacity, the mental bandwidth to even deal with it, you know? So um, my personal opinion is I think we need to get on Netflix with the UBI movement. If we can pull that off, I think we've like gotten golden because that's the most eyeballs. That's my opinion. I don't know how we get there. Yeah, do you have <laughs> any ideas about a format? <laughs> oh yeah. I have a lot of things. <laughs> no, please continue. I would say like what kind uh, of, the, well, yeah. Well, what, what sort of content okay. would you put on Netflix in brief? Okay. So, I mean, you would need, uh, data obviously um investigative maybe like um have interviews uh maybe uh get all the other countries together that have gotten this ubi movement started uh get them also interviewed to like be like okay this is not just a singular area thing you know and you address the counterpoints that we get the most you know um but you make it emotional so you get people who have their like really pulling stories i mean i got some pulling stories i mean i've uh i've already started writing it down you know um but i think if we pair that all uh because people are very visual and we got documents for days right we got all these podcasts for days but it's not like summarized and i think that's the problem and i think that's why we need netflix to be honest um but i think it would uh you know if you just ask people for their content uh because people have stuff and you know um, I think it would really do a lot. <laughs> we need a documentarian, I think, to do a good documentary then, you know, is what have you're you guys heard of the bootstraps film? I'm just going to, I'm just looking. I have not. It. What is it? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a film actually. They, they managed to fund a few people to, um, in the U S actually, uh, with a basic income and they followed their stories, but yeah, um, Conrad Shaw and, uh, his partner, I think her name is Dila is doing it. Um, documentary. But in the meantime, the UBI Lab yeah. Network. Bob just shared the um, the link. They've sort of compiled all of the uh, different sort of results and different um, stories that they've heard from people. So, and there's I think seventeen thousand or so. There's there's a huge amount there. So it's a way of how can you collect all the data, integrate it into sort of like a, a big spreadsheet, and then people can then go on almost a map, and then they can zoom in on their local area and they can see people who are like them and if you could get a picture with them or like an interview with them, it's sort of, you've got the data there that you can begin to explore. Obviously there's, sort of, um, there's issues with data protection and you know you, you can't just use people's data to uh, exploit it. But if you just build up that big, that big network, um, like for example, the petitions in the UK, um, when they get lodged into the government, there's a sort of um, a heat map of where people have signed it at different parts of the country. So that's also a very useful thing that if you had a big petition and you really um, channeled that and got people to engage with that, you can then look at different areas and different hotspots in the country which are particularly supportive or, or particularly not supportive. And then you can target your, area, your efforts in them sort of areas. Um, but also, I think there was a German film as well that was looking into basic income. And I've forgotten what the name of it was, but that was a few years ago. So some sort of, um, yeah, theatre, music. I'm sure there's people um, who are in the arts who would be happy to support some some movement. And maybe maybe you might take Andrew Yang himself to uh, to maybe get them contacts to really get them mobilised. But getting that would be really, really powerful. We have someone uh, who is on our show sometimes named Kiko, and she is uh, a member of the, I believe, I think it's called the Hudson Valley Arts Council, where I'm from. She lives pretty close to me. Um, and... I, you know, she might have uh, some of the connections that you're 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 describing. Um, as far as the data, there's a person, uh, Scott Santons, who you may know of. He's a UBI ex expert and advocate with quite a lot of data, quite a lot of theories and and uh, hypotheses, and uh, quite a lot of interesting ideas. And uh, talk to also, him about that if we if, if we want to, uh, you know, uh, Shale, Um, if we're talking a lot of times, uh, just the data isn't in you can have like all the data the logic and the reason in the world but yeah. what i found out is that if it doesn't connect with people on an emotional and personal level like it's not that powerful yeah, i i watched yeah i watched this video about like 
the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. So a lot of times uh, it's, it's really amazing. It's like if, if you find a common ground somewhere with a person who disagrees with you and then you try to go in to talk about what you're trying to do, it, it's a much better way than just meeting the people head on. I put a very powerful video on persuasion here in the chat and it's how, like, do you guys from the UK all know Mr. Rogers? Like, uh, well, I, I do, yeah. <laughs> so, so he went, he went to Congress and he, like, just by being calm and nice and friendly and, and relating to the senator on that kind of level, got like $2 million released from his for his show so a lot of people they say that like arguments are about logic and reason and who makes the most sense but i've tried that and mm -hmm. a lot of times like a person just has to say like i like this guy or this girl and i really don't want to disagree with them because they're so friendly and they're so cool so mm -hmm. like, that's something that yeah, that that can true. be used you know you yeah. gotta you have to work both angles Oh, got yeah. coming from both sides. I, I think it's important to also um, hit everybody's learning styles. Uh, I mean, I've been doing a lot of research on learning styles and there's about 11. I mean, there's more than that, but like 11 ones that I found. And, uh, you know, if you teach people in a specific order and make sure you hit every learning style, you will have reached the most amount of people. So you just optimize those techniques, uh, you know, lecture method or brainstorming method or, you know, um, so essentially even just this little think tank that we have on this podcast, like this is a thing that, uh, you know, helps people learn, right? Um, because you're expanding uh, your knowledge base. So I think if more people had access to the tools on how to learn how to even um, progress, I mean, it almost uh, aligns with uh, mastery of any subject. Um, and I've been practicing rewiring my brain a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's very successful uh, for me, you know, and I think um, we could help other people rewire their brain. But I think it would be the baseline is getting money to them so they can spend the time to work on themselves, right? So like, if people have money, they can have more mental bandwidth because they're not worrying about, you know, paying this means I can't pay this, which means I can pay maybe a little bit of this, you know, uh, we're not spending as much mental bandwidth on that, you know, and I think if we can um, make sure to uh, pre present things that are, um, you know, also power things encoded in our brain, you know, some people need facts, but some people need an emotional story. Uh, you know, it's, it's stuff like this, um, that I think if we can combine it all together, I think we could have something really powerful, uh, and very moving. And, um, in my research, I don't know if you guys have heard of the hero's journey. Um, but essentially, you know, like the, any series that exists, Harry Potter, uh, Star Wars, they all kind of follow the hero's the journey. The Campbellian journey, I think it's also called. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the movements of UBI are very much on track with the hero's journey, like, but on a bigger scale. Okay. And I think honestly, we're at the tail end. I think we're at the very end where it's like, because of this pandemic, we have created this, like, you know, um, death of ego, a, uh, defining moment in a lot of people's lives, you know? people aren't staying in their unhealthy relationships anymore. They're finding different housing if they need to, um, you know, th their ego's taking a blow. Um, but what happens after that is, um, rebirth, right? So that's where we are in this particular hero's journey. And I think, you know, we, we have some, uh, more challenges, but I don't think we're far off from getting it past, um, simply by plugging in, you know, uh, the events that have been happening worldwide. So just saying, <laughs> we're, we're close, guys. If we have something people can step into, though, uh, you know, then they won't be lost, you know, little puppies. They'll have, you know, open arms and like, let's let's work on this together. Let's revamp our country and or world, you know, especially if we combine with other movements like the UK movement, <laughs> you know, like uh, we're a powerful force. We exist everywhere and we just need to keep finding where we exist so we can grow, you know?
we had someone in Canada too. I mean, this is this is going to be worldwide uh, eventually. Like they they did they even had a UBI test in Iran of all places. But you know that's 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 a whole nother thing. Uh, I I was interested to know like what is the main opposition to uh, basic income that you come across with the UK because over here in the US we're a very like Calvinistic kind of Protestant work culture. So they're like, people will just instantly become lazy and not work. And then it's like, no, no, people have like intrinsic purposes and they want to do things for their, for their own reasons. And we were get, we got that $1,200 stimulus check and no, everybody just didn't say like, Oh, I don't want to do anything anymore. That didn't happen. So is that the same you're getting over there or it's too expensive or both those? Yeah, both. Okay. Them, yeah. And also, right. why why do the rich get it? Mm. Okay, yeah, same. And those are probably the three yeah, main ones. One I we think the, the, one of the biggest troubles yeah, in the UK, obviously, our, our systems of government have been in place for so very, very long that it has entrenched the kind of the, the, our, our forelock tugging ways to what's perceived to be our betters, which are just people who've been lucky enough to have been born into money forever same here it's just gonna same, be really hard to same, same thing. thing and on top of that uh have you been seeing like the cynical mindset that goes a little bit deeper than that where the belief that if when everyone gets money there's going to be massive scarcity and riots will start because people have money but can't buy goods like we can't produce everything in the world <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know if you guys in the UK know, but here in America, we have three empty livable homes for every homeless person. So I'm not too scared about scarcity. It's a distribution problem. Yeah, same, so I have a, um, I'd like to uh, come in for a minute because uh, just yesterday morning, I did a um, live stream with a man who is part of UBI Kenya. And I'm wondering if any of the people on our show have had a chance to contact um, people in Africa or in Kenya. <laughs> My friends are having a fight <laughs> about the hiking. Um, so anyway, um, what they, what's happening in Kenya right now is they have a, a devastating locust that just uh, wiped out a lot of things. And then they had a flood. And so some people's homes and their farms and all of their livelihood has been wiped away by that. And I think if you want to find them, they're on Facebook at um, UBI Movement. So, um, or I, I don't know if that's, if that's right. I think it is. So um, I'm just interested in, you know, what contacts we've had with other countries besides the United States and UK. Canada. Here. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting. What about you guys? There is some African countries that have done it. Yeah, there's Kenya, and I think is it Uganda or Namibia? I think Namibia possibly. Various other countries around the world. There, there was not. Finland that did that one trial. Spain did the trial. Yeah, there's also yeah. those places around are doing it. It's um, that's the sort of um, when the when the basic income Earth network uh, was sort of set up in the you know years ago, and then they've they've uh, really pushed it, and in India as well, I think. Um, they had the the basic income Earth Network conference Congress there a few years ago, uh, so there is there is a lot of work going on around the world, and I think probably it, it it's, seems to be that they've split it off almost into sort of developing countries, and then ones that are more economically developed, and they've looked at them in, in completely different ways, and I think that that has some merits because um, if you've got a lot of sort of people living on subsistence and a lot of general uh, sort of absolute poverty that is in a different state to uh, an economy which is fully developed and I think that has to be a sort of a consideration um, so I think probably Canada um, the European countries America um, UK Japan them sort of countries are probably ones that are going to have more uh, in line with uh, sort of in terms of us um, um, but but yes there's, there's lots to be learned probably from looking around all of the world so and actually, um, the one done in Iran, they found out that people actually wanted to like study more and work more. So complete opposite of like what they think would happen. I mean, like, I don't understand. Here's the thing, like 
the skeptics and the ones who are against it, it's like, okay, let's do a trial run and let's see what you say about like people like would, would all of a sudden like not want to work or not do that. Let's see if it's actually true because it's, it, I've seen that it's not. And we, we really have to get like, like um towards the people who hold their hands on the lever levers of power. And unfortunately, like a lot of them are kind of like corporations tell them what to do. Uh, multinational companies tell them what to do. So if we tell these corporations and multinational companies that, hey, this idea is good for you too, because people will have more money to spend at your stores and at your places, it's like, why be against it? So that's just my two cents. Yeah, we have to definitely... Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, you're starting to see some corporations actually start to back some more progressive, generally speaking, candidates in America just because they are starting to actually win. And but hopefully the other UBI progressives, you know, there are a few ways to go with progressivism. No, I, just, I would be interested uh, from Jeremy. I mean, it's one of the things is we're trying to put together a kind of pro- a cross party coalition about basic income um we've not it's interesting because basic income used to be more supported by like the the tories and um and the liberals and now it's more sort of labor green or progressive but we're also very interested in in um you know what what conservatives are thinking about basic income in the u.s and how you're finding that all right so yeah our our activism is still in its early early stages, but what our, what our goal is, is to shift the Overton window of the issue from a, mm-hmm. uh, from, from, a, from a left issue to just a center issue. So our goal, our goal is to, uh, is to find these, these Republicans and conservatives that will adopt this platform because it would encourage the, their, their Democratic challengers to also adopt the same policy, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, like if, if, uh, if, if a Republican or Libertarian or conservative uh, whatever have you, is further to the left than you on this issue, then it kind of puts them in a position to, to also adopt it as well. So that's we're, we're trying to shift it from you know, just to the center. It, it's, it's not a left or right issue, and and uh, yeah, we're trying to break that uh, that narrative. You you know, like conservatives, the one thing they don't like are big bureaucracies and giant uh, paternalistic welfare. And we're saying like a basic income like gets rid, cuts through a lot of bureaucracies and then just goes directly to the people who need it. Like, why would you pay a bureaucrat half of your tax dollars when you can maybe spend less of your tax dollars and it just goes straight to the person who needs it without all these strings attached? And and conservative and and like libertarians want that kind of you know freedom and freedom. So that's it. Like no means testing because that all costs money too. Mm. You know. Yeah, and one Fair thing that hand. we're doing um, with messaging here is we're also pointing out that this is good for the economy. It's good for business. It's good for individuals. It actually helps in so many ways. In the case of the states it helps them not have to be as reliant on the federal government. So it has multiple layers. It's just tailoring the message to the audience. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, it, c- c- getting conservatives on board is, is integral, in my opinion. And how do you do that is a, is a big question. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, I think a, a battle is, currently that we're having, is that you know the political compass of different scales of left and right and authoritarian? I think it seems to be that it's sort of shifting on the conservative side, is slightly more towards the authoritarian right rather than the libertarian right. And I think it might be uh, something that you, the candidates are people who maybe are more sort of libertarian might be uh, more willing to back a basic income rather than a sort of more authoritarian, big uh, not not a big state, but a uh, a, a more a powerful state in certain areas um, might be a, a, a sort of way forward. I don't really know how to target them people, um, but but that's sort of something that I would um, maybe maybe advise but getting that on board it's you know lots of governments around the world it seems to be over the last several years that it has sort of shifted slightly more right um you know it's certainly in europe we've got um some some very right-wing governments in in um uh, czech republic and poland um probably the right is the right 
the most right-wing government we've had in the UK for 30 years, and it's sort of similar in the in, in America. So it's that seems to be shifting that wave. So how can we how can we encourage them who are shifting that narrative to to encourage them to adopt basic income? Well, exactly. Uh, I, I have a confession, like going on what you said, Martin. I have a confession. I was a former Trump supporter, <laughs> and the 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 reason was because um, he was he, like he was talking about the jobs, you know, coming back. And I had like a very terrible time in the job market, and I thought like, oh, he was a businessman, and we'd get more money and stuff like that just totally and then and then when he got elected i'm like okay this guy sucks like but like but but the thing is is that then when andrew yang came in and he said you know trump got the problems right but his solutions were all nonsense and and thing because the jobs are being automated they're not coming back as as kind of like coming from that conservative side, it like it, it it made that spark go off for me. So if we can just do more of that for other conservatives or people like who are conservative leaning, it's like it it it's like the jobs, it's automation and it's not immigrants and stuff like that. That what Andrew did, we had so many people who came from the Trump side supporting Andrew and his basic his universal basic income idea. Something I find quite interesting is uh yeah, which is a, a fear i think with a lot of you know right-wing politicians is this sort of if you give people the money we haven't got the money to give people the money and the economy will collapse i mean what do they imagine that people are going to do they're not going to hide the money under the bed they're going right. to go out and spend right. it no. into the economy so this and, is and our government a sided argument out. that the economy right. will collapse all you're doing is rejigging it slightly yeah, and, and they have all the money in the world for corporations. You know, they give it to yeah, corporations yeah. who just reinvest exactly. in themselves and don't spend it. And then the economy does collapse and they go, well, we are uh, the world's reserve currency. We can print money, but if we print too much, we might not be the world's reserve currency anymore. We better only print lots and lots for corporations who already have lots of money. And just they just can't stop the cycle because both parties really Insanity. only they're going to serve their primary donors, the corporations. Uh, over their nominal, nominal donors. This is completely true for both Democrats and the Republicans. They're both completely owned corporate parties, and that's kind of the problem. And uh, getting back to what you said, Martin, the shift towards a more authoritarian right, away from more libertarian right, uh, tracks with that because the right, the Republicans in America or anywhere, you know, whatever the conservative party is, this is generally the, the true. They're going to serve, uh, just like the left, their primary donors over their nominal donors. Their primary donors are corporations, and corporations are more of an authoritarian type of right, where it's, you know, do what you're told, do this job, make money for me, stay, stay in line, be a conformist, do just like everybody else, and we'll get along. Whereas um, individuals uh, who are involved on, on the right in politics tend to have more of a libertarian individualist ideology, you know? so. As corporations have become richer, more ascendant, and as um, you know, uh, donation laws have been laxed and laxed and laxed, and how much a person can donate to, to a political campaign in this country, um, you know, versus how much an organization can donate, there are just no limits with with the uh, back doors we have today. Uh, yeah. So so it tracks that you know as as companies became more powerful and individuals became less powerful the politics of the right became authoritarian and the politics of the left here became um, neoliberal yes, uh, yes. anyway and, go on. and to add on to that it's like corporations have become like the modern kings and queens of medieval europe that, so that i'd like to it's like you know, okay are you i'd like to uh I'd like to uh, go back to the reason why I asked about the African situation or UBI and uh, places where, you know, cost of living and income and all that is much lower than ours. Because I'm, I used to think, you know, it absolutely has to start here in the United States. Because after all, this is where all the money is. So if some country is going to print all the money, it better be us, right? I mean, we're the de facto world currency. We're already supplying the world. But I think that... Um, I think that the um, nations in Africa and other places um, are better at being cohesive and being, um, you know, trying to get a gain of power as a group. You know, for example, they're much more, um, they're using the United Nations right now and they're using it very well. And if I've, you know, like 
I've been doing this for advocacy for like a year about. And during this year, I had not gone to the UN convention on the universal convention, you know, the universal human rights that every country is signed onto, including ours. And I have not gone into that document and said, hey, let me pull out this article that says people have a right to certain things. You know what I mean? And so I think um, one of the problems that we're having is we don't trust other nations because they're poor. We don't trust people within our country because they're poor for the same reason. We have the same racial and, you know, same sort of, uh, you know, prejudices against people who are who are poor in our country as we would against somebody who's far away from us. We definitely have a hard time building trust with someone we don't see. So um, I'm wondering if that, you know, what do you think? Is it like sufficient to just sort of stay in our country? Because if we bring it to an international perspective, you know, uh, in, in my country, in East Texas, definitely, people would be like, we don't care about those people over there. You know, well, you know, you have to make both arguments, really. I've, you know, I've been privileged to be able to uh, participate in in basic income Earth Network congresses. And there I've met people from Kenya and from India, from Indonesia, um, from uh, Sierra Leone, from Malawi. Uh, you know, there are there are sort of like pockets of people. And if you go on to the basic income Earth Network site, uh, you'll find uh, the different affiliated groups uh, around the world. So if you want to, you know, connect with specific countries, I mean, there's not a group in every country, obviously, but but it's getting up towards like 70. Um, so that'll be about half the countries in the world, I think. Um, and, Could you put that link in the chat? If you yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah. up there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, Basic Income Earth Network. Um, yeah, unfortunately, because of COVID, they were supposed to have a, a Congress in, uh, in fact, in, in September this year, but that's been canceled in, uh, in Australia. But the last Congress was in Hyderabad in, in India. And um, yeah, so that was really interesting. They really focused at, in, the organizers of that con Congress really focused on people who had participated in pilots. So they had, uh, some women, particularly women from the um, from the pilots in India. I don't know if you guys have heard of those, um, which were very interesting. And Kenya, they had some people from the Give Directly pilot in Kenya. Uh, one of the women who's sort of helping run that, and then one of the participants. Um, there are videos online. I'll I'll kind of after I stop speaking, I'll start. I'll I'll look around for those. But um, there were some really interesting interventions there. Um, well that's nice of you to introduce them to us. And but my, I think my question is really like, do you think it's of benefit in the UK to talk about um, other places or if it's just something that turns people off? Um, I wouldn't say that it turns people off. I think they're actually interested to know that this is an international movement. And actually, you know, like when you get people saying, oh, well, you know, if we get basic income, then the whole world is going to kind of park on our doorstep to get it, you know. Um, I find it really useful to talk about the fact that there is an international movement, that there are, that, you know, there are people demanding basic income all over the world. And while we may not all get it at the same time, um, you know, there are people demanding it. And, um, you know, we hope that, 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 you know, you know, that eventually we'll all be successful. Um, I mean, the thing is, you know, what we get really is the whole kind of immigration thing on both sides. All right. So there are people who are worried that migrants wouldn't get a basic income. And then there are people who are worried that migrants would get a basic income, all right? So, I mean, I always use the example of the Alaska dividends, you know, that anybody in the US can go up and live in Alaska for a year and then they can get the dividends. Um, but you don't see sort of hundreds of thousands of people rushing up there to get it. You know? well, somehow we don't do that. Yeah, I, you, who knew, all right? <laughs> I could do it. I could do it any time, and yet I never do. I don't know. Hey, you know, so um, you know, so there's that part of there's the my you know pro and anti migration side of things, um, but also it's I mean for me I think it's just very enriching to to meet people from all over the world you know who are fighting on this subject. I think there's I think there's a way that I mean I'm from the left kind of by tribe you know from my background and stuff, but 
um, I find, I've just found being in this movement for the last sort of, what is it now, seven years, has been such an enriching personal experience, you know, because uh, just, I don't know, there's something about like, once you accept that people have a right to un unconditional money and that it's our share of the economy, um, and it, you know, that the cost of poverty, you know, this is actually one kind of right wing argument for it, which is that the cost of poverty and the cost of insecurity are so huge, all right, that they kind of dwarf the cost of basic income altogether. Um, yeah, so, you know, I find I've, I've found that, you know, having that kind of perspective that, you know, giving people money would be a good thing and not controlling them would also be a good thing. Um, you know, I'm just meeting such amazing people and, and with such a great perspective on things. So I, you know, for me, it's, it's been kind of a blast actually, <laughs> not to sound like too hedonistic. Like the ultimate, amazing. I, I think that the thing that binds the United States and uh, the United Kingdom together is not only English, but the financial system that we share and our system of bureaucratic um, governance. And, you know, a lot of what we do, we may say we're democratic and then we broke away from <laughs> Mother England and all this, but actually we continued our colonialism. We continued the, um, we sort of continued the bureaucratic systems that, you know, this is how we believe good people run the world. You know, we administrate. And, and so we just replaced kings and queens with like uh, people with like high prestige and like celebrities yeah, and with presidents people and in corporations. Presidents. Sorry, go ahead, Faye. I, I just have to say that. It's fine. And also, of course, uh, we still have a common religion in that we both kind of share Christianity. And I noticed that the African, um, you know, the Kenyans that was I, I was speaking with, he was also very... Um, you know, he clings to God and he uh, uses his religion every day, you know, to give him strength during this time. So I find that, but the way that he practices is very different than how we practice it in the United States, or at least for many people here. <laughs> I, I see a lot of uh, different types of practice. Is religion and, um, you know, still an important source of, uh, you know, personal decision making and things like that? And how does that, how do they speak about UBI? I don't UK. know, but did the Pope come out in support of UBI? But he'll yes, he yes. did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't yeah. know religion in this country, Martin. Who are religious conservatives who are sort of, you know, very sort of want everything to be traditional and the way that it's always been, uh, they are very, very difficult to, I think, um, trying to persuade them that a basic income is the right thing to do. But I think a lot of people um, who are religious will also see the values uh, and, and that we will be led by the sort of rights that everyone should have, and they will see that as a sort of um, as, a, as a, a fairness in a way. And if, I mean, you kind of go back to the, you know Jesus and uh, all about looking after the neighbor and um, a lot of the things that he said. You know, he he would, would, would you could use them in terms of a basic income, but you can twist his words. And Donald Trump could use them and um, mm -hmm. use them to manufacture a particular style of uh, politics. So religion is a very, very difficult area. And I always say that we should leave politics and religion separately. Um, and I think that's the best way to leave them. Um, but yeah, I, I agree but, with you, Martin, because yeah. religion is by and large, I, I see my mother is a priest, actually. So I've been dragged into more churches than I would wish to be. And there's a lot of narrow minded, mean spirited, jealous people in religion it attracts them so you know i, I think well, a lot of christians I mean, I, are not christian sorry. yeah, yeah. I, I have i beg to differ actually okay <laughs> there were some yeah I, there was a recently a conversation that the basic income conversation brought together um i'm just trying to find it actually but that which was actually a, a bunch of different christians from around the uk talking about basic income and it's kind of relationship to the Bible and and how, um, you know, Christ would have supported a basic income and, you know, and then how it's part of, you know, sharing the wealth, basically, which is, you know, and making sure that everybody, you know, if you kind of try to emphasize the best in Christianity, then then it really is not a bad, you know, basic income is quite a quite a, an interesting policy. I've just put in the chat box um, a book that was written here by a vicar named uh, Malcolm Tory, who also uh, for, for a long time was involved with the Citizens Basic Income Trust called Citizens Basic Income, a Christian Social Policy. Um, 
yeah so if somebody else can talk i'm going to look for that video and i'll put it up on the, on the okay so i just wanted to ask since we're on the subject of uh christianity and ubi uh what are your guys' thoughts on the pope actually endorsing ubi especially on easter sunday um yeah it was really interesting he's been kind of creeping towards it for a while uh there was some discussion within the within uh, the Basic Income Earth Network, whether he really meant Basic Income or whether he kind of meant something else, all right? Um, so, you know, I think people, you know, again, I think in a way it's like, I mean, inequality is not really the, you know, although, uh, you know, a lot has been made of inequality and, and how bad it is on the left. Um, it's actually insecurity, uh, which, is, which is really affecting people. You know, I mean, I don't really care if somebody has two or three cars or five houses or whatever, but I do care whether I can pay my rent in, you know, next month. Amen. Do, that is know, better rhetoric. Care. That is much better that rhetoric. Is much, yeah. Well, I'm I, not sure why I've never seen it uh, presented that way, but I think I, that is just a better argument for a be, lot because, of audiences. Because um, do you guys know in the UK, no Bernie Sanders, maybe not. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah, I remember yeah. that okay. verbiage. Well, uh, let's well, not say inequality. Let's say the issue is insecurity. insecurity. Right. That is because something that, 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 that I think really like staunch stiff sober minds will respond to yes because because the problem is like we're, we're always framing everything so divisively yeah. and i think a uh, part part of the e even a lot of people in the bernie camp not not all but a lot when they saw yang like this newcomer they were like no 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 bernie almost won last time we can't have this and then we're like chill like my god it it, it it was it was crazy because because they because they say like they're the ones who have taken our stuff and our money and they're not paying their fair share and then that closed off a lot of conservatives and a lot of people but then when yang came in and yang said hey it belongs to all of us it's all of ours and everybody deserves like a decent level of floor that got a lot more people to come in the fold because they didn't feel like they were being attacked as the bad people. No, I really think the issue of insecurity is massive, you know, and I think if we're talking about authoritarianism and I think there's authoritarianism on the left as well. Okay. I mean, it's mm. not just an we'll issue. agree with that. Right? Yeah. You know, um, it's really people kind of grasp, trying to grasp at some kind of, you know, some kind of certainty. All right. You know, somebody's going to solve their problems and whether, you know, it involves, you know, sending in more police or whether it involves, you know, the government kind of stepping in in all different places, um, you know, people are kind of drifting, drifting towards authoritarianism and on, on both sides, you know. And I think, you know, so like this whole kind of progressive narrative of, you know, the, I mean, the 99 versus the 1%, again, it's like, I don't know, you know, what people's backgrounds are, but, you know, there's certainly in this country, um, you know, the insecurity is actually affecting people higher and high at higher and higher levels. All right. So like people who used to have like really good uh, secure jobs and very well paid jobs in the civil service, you know, are being asked to reapply for their jobs are being told that they, you know, have to be, you know, so-called self-employed, um, you know, where the security is just kind of goes up in a poof or even, uh, you know, like a friend uh, who's involved with basic income, um, he trained as a lawyer, all right? And, uh, you know, even though he trained as a lawyer and he's got a very good, you know, uh, accent, okay, <laughs> very posh accent, you know, um, it's really difficult for him to find a secure job these days, you know? Um, and so I really think we need to be emphasizing the, the insecurity of people's lives mm -hmm. and trying to solve that, you know, um, in some, you know, in some tangible way, rather than, you know, again, the inequality, I'm, you know, I get the arguments about it, you know, I get the arguments against inequality, uh, and there's some good, there was a very good um, book here called The Spirit Level, which has been taken up by a lot of, a lot of professors here, but, you know, really, again, when it comes down to it, most people, it's not about carrying about what other people have it's about the fact you know that you don't know from one month or one week to the next you know whether you can put food on the table whether you can pay your rent whether you can put you know, gas in your car in the states or you know whether you can pay for your transport to get to work or 
you know, that sort of thing, you know, and, and that's, I mean, like our problem with the Tories in this country, with the conservatives in this country is that they very much invested in a, in a welfare scheme called uh, universal credit. All right. And that's kind of acts, it's supposed to like, without all the other stuff, it would kind of be acting like a negative income tax. All right. But the way it actually operates, um, where people are, asked her, you know, to spend horrendous amounts of time looking for work, pretends that nobody has anything else to do. Um, even if you have a job that is regular, the income fluctuates from month to month, depending on, on your payday. Yeah, so, you know, it's actually, you know, and it, unfortunately it's called universal credit. So then some people on, some people mix it up with universal basic income, which is, you know, Insidious. very different, basically, All yeah. Right. So they, you know, and this this system isn't even all the way put in. Okay, they instituted it in, in they started it in twenty eight in twenty thirteen, but it's still kind of it, it's still being implemented. Okay, it, it's taken them forever because partly because of all the problems with it, um, you know, and it's supposed to make work pay, but actually it doesn't, you know. And I think that's another, you know, that's another issue. Um, just one more issue that I want to talk about, and then I'm probably going to have to leave pretty soon. I'm sorry. Um, okay, you've given it, us a good hour. It's been a fascinating talk. Thank you. Is that, um, you know, people, and I think Andrew, Andrew Yang got this really, really right, okay, in his campaign, is that people don't want to feel that they're on welfare, all right? And that's just a fact. And I, you know, so I'm, you know, I, I'm always talking about this as like our fair share of the economy. This is our social inheritance. This is, you know, the, the thing we need to be able to rely on each month or, or things like that. Because although I've been on welfare, I've been a welfare rights advisor in the past, you know, I'm totally in people having what they need. Um, you know, often, you know, like when I'm out on the street, I don't know what your, your take is on, the, on this, Faye, but when I'm out on the street, I, I, ne I almost never talk about this as welfare. All right, because, you know, good or bad all right and it's it's really it really turns people off all right they don't want to think of themselves as being on welfare however if you know like talking about well this is our security this is our you know like what somebody was calling basic income everybody's social security i guess that's welfare in the state so maybe that's not a good thing but um but in this country you know like talking about our fair share and this is our share of the economy that we all participate in, or how do you, you know, how are you contributing? And often it's not, you know, again, it's like, it's often people are contributing to the economy, uh, whether they get paid to do a job or not, right? Well, so, you know, so then people, you know, so people can talk about that. And uh, we all, we've also collected stories and I really recommend the map that I put up earlier for, I mean, just some amazing stories from people about how basic income would um, would improve their lives, and yeah, and I, you know, again, I, I do try to, yeah, just personally, I try to avoid the welfare conversation. I think it's, you know, it's more about justice and, and yeah, and solving the insecurity problem. Yeah, yeah. That's you, you hit the nail on the head. I just. Talk. Thomas Paine just said it's like for when you're born into the world, like nobody says like this land is yours or this land isn't yours. The world is already carved up into pieces of land like before you were born and people had that land before you were born. So it's like who's to say what was what when you never had a say in this. So this is just your compensation for all that land that was carved up that you never had a say in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ahead, Absolutely. But we also see this now, you know, in... Um, you know, in invention, you know, in the tech, in the tech world. Okay. I mean, most mm -hmm. of the, most of the tech world is driven by things that were, uh, you know, Done things that people. were discovered and paid for by the U S taxpayer. All right. And that's just a fact. All right. I mean, again, I know that personally because my dad was a military scientist. All right. But, you know, and I saw that, you know, I saw the work that he did and, and, you know, and he, and he and his colleagues were paid $250 per patent. And that included, all right, Polaroid lenses. All right, just think about that, all right? That included, you know, um, that included casts, you know, casts, breathable casts, you know, like when you break your leg or something, all right? That included uh, memory foam, all right? You know, so you just think, I mean, all of those things were invented for the US military, 
and they've turned into extremely profitable, you know, commercial products. And they were basically just given away. All right. You know, this is this is something that's really owed to people. You know, I quite like uh, what is it? James Felton Keith, who's running, who was running for. Yeah, I, really like I don't think he got the primary, but he was running in New York. I mean, yep. you know, he has a one. I think, you know, his his strap line. We owe us. I mean, I think yeah. it's fantastic. I love um, it. He was running right near me. Yeah. Oh, right. Great. Yeah. I mean, it's not really unfortunate he didn't get, you know, he didn't get any farther. No, but. I really hope he runs again. But I, I, yeah. I also responded to that. I, I told him when I, I sent him a message as soon as I read it. I was like, this is a really good tagline. This is traction. We have to remember this one. So, yeah. Absolutely. You know, so, I mean, I think all of that, I mean, you know, you've got the inheritance issue. You've got the land issue. You know, there are a lot of people who want to pay for basic income using land value tax. Um but, you know, you've got the fact, and Guy Standing talks about this, all right, you know, at least in the UK, uh, something like 60 to 70 percent of the wealth in, in the UK is actually uh, is, is actually transferred through inheritance. All right. That's not somebody earning it, you know, and it's not to say that people can't earn anything. And but we need to be supporting and especially, go, you know, coming out from covid, we need to be supporting people to, you know, make a good, you know, make a better good living at, at what they what they really love and want to do. And that's going to be the most productive thing that we could do. I think we also forget how much power we could have if like everyone in just this phone call took their UBI and maybe just $50 of it, right? $50 and maybe like that combines into something that we could build a giant thing for, right? We, we could finally finance anything because we collected all our money together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for a big goal and maybe a big purchase, right? Uh, it, but imagine that on an organizational scale, like if it was a bigger scale and everyone in an organization just chipped in a little bit of their UBI move money and then, and or in every community, we could finally buy those big ticket items that we haven't been able to afford because of big business, right? We could finally be like, oh, you know what? Our town could really use some new infrastructure and uh, we could do it ourselves if we had the machine, right? We have the skills. We just like, you know, the big business took it when they left, right? And so we would be able to pull back resources uh, collectively as community um, and or as organizations to actually make a bigger impact in the world, you know? Um, and we would have more say in how it's spent. <coughs> whether uh, other than you know uh big business taking all the money and all of the uh okays and polluting our areas when really we just need to hire a team of people to pick up the pollution right uh or clean up the pollution or build a filter that makes it better you know um and it would give more power to the people because they're like i helped with this i was part of the planning I did the proposal with these people and they're all like emotionally tied into it too. Right. Because right now we don't even have power to fix any of the problems that big businesses have caused because we're barely surviving. So I think we need to work together. <laughs> yeah. Also, Faye, you, you talk about power of the people because I think people say, Oh, well, this is never going to work because our governments won't allow and they won't allow us to have this. The people in power are a tiny, tiny amount of the total people in the world. If you can get everyone on board, they wouldn't be, and I'm not talking about violent action, but sort of non-violent action. They can't resist 98% of the world going, hey, hello, we're not happy with this. They wouldn't be able to. So we have to sort of join together. Revolution comrades. Even like 30% of the world yeah. people really would have to listen to <laughs> yes, it realistically. It's, it's not well, even so funny really all that. that. It's three and a half percent of our population doing something noticeable. That's the major push since we are in population so large now. Yeah. But the interesting well, thing is when we talk about power, we talk about it as if it's some intrinsic thing. The real definition of power is people being able to get things done through other people. Mm -hmm. As soon as people stop listening, that power goes away. And it's simply a matter of choice. And if enough people choose to stop listening, that power automatically dissipates. So realistically, power is something that ebbs and flows. Yeah, it's interesting because it's obviously when you give people, um, you know, their financial security, that, that could be deemed as a, a massive threat to the establishment in terms of every individual can do what they want. Um, and I just 
personally think that the, the neoliberal idea of individualism, you know, it, you may as well take it to its full extent. So you break down a lot of the general sort of arguments that they've been making about individuals should you know, do work and contribute to the economy, but they're not willing to give the individuals a, a sort of a fair share and a flaw. So I think that that's a bit of a um, bit of a yeah a big flaw in their sort of ideology and thinking. Hypocrisy. Uh, but yes, it, it is, and you know, and they they are happy to do that, but then they're also happy to increase the growth and inequality, and then allow people to to sort of fall through the gaps. And that's why it's a flaw, and it's a flaw that, that doesn't have holes in it. So it's not like a very you know um, sponge or like a colander where you just sort of end up leaking through. And that, so we don't want that. We want a very solid flaw that everyone can be supported on. I- um, I always said, get those people with the same philosophy, put them in the middle of nowhere with no money, with no contacts on their phone, with no nothing, and just tell them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. How many of them would take that on? Go ahead, Martin. I just said yeah, well, there was a, that's there was, what we have to put on Netflix right there. There, so. there was a liberal thinker, I've forgotten what he was called, back in the sort of, I think, 50s, 60s. Um, he was sort of seeing as a, as a thought experiment is – Okay, you were bought. You were, you know, you didn't have any sort of inheritance from anyone, and you were just sort of in your womb and in, in uh, with in your mom's womb, um, and you're thinking, okay, what what world do you want to be born into? But you know, what would you want? What would your your key things that you want? And you'd ask for, well, you know, you'd ask for, ask for some security, wouldn't you? You'd ask for financial security. You'd ask for healthcare security. You'd ask for you know an opportunity in life just to have the education and to fulfill your goals. That's what all the things that you would want. So if you take away everyone's sort of uh, biases and perceptions that they've grown up with, and then when they're 25, they're now voting and they're now super ultra conservative because they possibly have, have um, had privilege or had a, had a particular life or and had certain life experiences. If you go back to that first stage, everyone will want the same thing, which is that security. So um, I think using that thought experiment is quite a powerful thing uh, just to sort of say, what would you want if you didn't, if you, you know, were just coming into the world fresh and new, you'd want that security. And guys, the starting, key in the world. inevitables, right? Sorry, Sorry? Say that security in the inevitability. Of, security is in the inevitability of being a human, mm. right? There's certain things that are inevitable that we need, like a bathroom, somewhere to sleep, somewhere, something to eat, right? Like we just want those needs met. Wouldn't that be great? The proper care and feeding of humans. <laughs> yeah. And it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's a really powerful thing. That that pyramid that is is a really really powerful thing that everyone should be sort of told at school, in my opinion. And how do we get that into the curriculum? That's another thing about education, about seeing people that you know. It's uh, it my people might think it's common sense that you target your resources into the people who need it the most. But I would I would argue that universalism is a, is a much better concept, and getting that into again the mainstream thought about universalism is really really another key concept. But yeah, Maslow's hierarchy of needs address everyone's physiological needs, um, you know, and then it just uh, cascades up to the top. And someone who's interested in the environment, the the top need is the environment, and unfortunately you're not going to be able to get people to respect the environment as much as it needs if you're not addressing all of their social connections, their social networks, the community around them and their physiological needs. Um, so getting them, uh, it is a human right. It should be a universal de- you know, declaration of human rights has not been implemented. And that should be obviously something that we should be pushing for, but it is a human right. But then looking at that pyramid and um, uh, spreading that is something that could be really important. Great stuff, Martin. Guys, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to chip off. Um, Thank you so much. It was, yeah. it was wonderful to have you, Barb. Uh, we'd love to have you again sometime. Yeah, we, we yeah anytime. Just, just give Thank me a shout. You. And really great to meet you all. And good luck with everything. And good luck with kind of spreading the news around. I put loads of links in the chat box, so maybe save that and uh, explore those for later. And uh, yeah, please keep in touch. I mean, I think, you know, what's happened in the last uh, couple day, a uh, couple of years around basic income, particularly with Andrew Yang's movement has been fantastic. Um, I personally had a few niggles with his particular plan, but hey ho, you know, I mean, I think at the moment, uh, the way we are, I think we need to make that case for universalism, that it's actually the best way to reach people who need it most, all right? That's the other thing that people don't talk about is how basic income, you know, okay, it reduces bureaucracy for the government, but actually it reduces bureaucracy for poor people, all right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, if you've ever had to deal with a welfare system of any kind, um, the, 
the the amount of there's discrimination with just makes you just want you just lose the will to live practically right oh, you've been there so yeah, i have yeah you know so i mean it really i think it's i think this is a really important thing and you know i think it's a really important movement it's really fantastic uh you know if you kind of explore more the, in fact there's a latin american a group that's just been set up recently. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the details to hand, but you know, if you keep if you keep an eye on on the on the Basic Income Earth Network website, they usually have the latest news about what's happening globally. Um, and I think you know, I think this is like the one thing. I mean, besides anti-war, okay, and for the and also for the environment, you know, basic income is the other thing. Okay, it's the other thing that's really a global. Uh, you know, a global concern and and um, and has the potential to be a really truly global movement. So again, thank you all and huge amounts of luck. And thank you, Maggie and Martin. Hopefully, see you soon. Um, yeah. So I'll let you get on with it. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, thank you again, Barbara. Bye bye. Fantastic. Have a great day, Barb. You too. Thanks. Richard said some sort of that you two had some kinds of like backstories. And uh, let's see, like, like, can can we relate it to basic income or like where you've been? Because because it's like some people say like 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 I don't know. He gave me some kind of like a credential or something. Oh, uh, I'm a I'm a former actor. I've got tons of backstories, but you know, which which particular one do you want? Well, it's just something I think it was. Like, um, it might even be new yeah. Ariel saying ages ago about. Um, uh, you know, pe the way people are valued, I think, is. Uh, interesting so yeah we the groups that I run in Brighton for mums uh we're a charity so we have quite a lot of free yeah, place, that's um don't have a lot of money uh and you know for mothers the work that they do as mothers is not valued you're just told oh you signed up for that you you wanted to have a child kind of negating the point that society we were all children once society is people's children grown up so that because their work is not valued, that has a very negative impact on their mental health. I see it in, in the group. So we never say, oh, when are you going back to work? Because women are always asked when you're going back to work. What the hell do you think we're doing? Yeah. You know, you're up all night changing nappies, feeding your baby. Well, that's, is that not work? And yet somehow sitting in an office tapping on a screen, that's work, is it? Phoning up someone to yeah. say, oh, you've been in a car accident and you need compensation. Is that work? Of course it isn't. So this I get very, work, I get work very care for someone at some point in their life. It might be a child. It might be an elderly person. It might be to say, you know, we all care for someone at some point, And that is not valued. That's somehow seen to demean it by calling it work. But, but yet work, when you go to other people's homes, thing. Y y the ironic thing is, but when you go to other people's homes with other people's families and other people's children, then it's work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah yeah ridiculous and and it's the the amazing okay so think about this in 08 we had the financial crash mm. who crashed our finances all the people who have been like financializing our economy for the past 12 years instead of getting punished they got rewarded mm. for failing how do you explain that how how in God's green earth do you explain that and and they don't want to call what you're doing work when they what they were working on was crashing our economy and they got compensated for it? It boggles the mind. There's different calculations that you can do, and there's a good one um, uh, released by uh, the UK government. It was a few years ago. It's a few uh, years old now from the Office of National Statistics, and it was just a very very simple uh, thing that poss possibly a tool that could be. Um, used in America if you could uh, create one. But basically, you, you had like a sort of a timeline or like a scale and you put your scale about how many hours per week that you did of like childcare, of, of cooking, of cleaning, uh, all these different things. And you had a list of them and you added up how many unpaid hours you did and each like per hour. So like childcare might be £12 per hour or cooking might be £8.50 an hour or whatever. Um, and then you add them all up and you can find out how much unpaid work you're doing per day, per week, per month, per year. And most people are doing, you know, tens of, often tens of thousands of pounds of unpaid work during the year. So almost, again, that's just going back to the idea of being a, being a right and being fair, then it, 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 that's just the sort of calculation that can be, that can be shared around and say, look, the, you are doing the work. It's just that you're contributing to society in a different way, but it, you don't have to be technically in a job to be contributing. 
Um, so that tool is it can be can be quite, quite powerful to get out to people if it could be made in the uh, America that would be great. Why yes, Martin, I'm going to build on Martin's thing because I actually happen to have right here a statistic. Oh. This is actually from a book that came out about three four years ago, so it's probably a little slightly out of date. Again, it's to do with mothers, which said there was around two million mothers at home in the UK. These women are branded as economically inactive by the, the Office for National Statistics. The value of informal childcare is calculated by them as £343 billion pounds per year, which is 23% of GDP. Mm. So, yeah, massive, huge. Yeah. And, massive. And also, I'm glad you're doing that work. Yeah, it's yeah. just really. Because all, all the stuff about, you know, mothers probably and fathers as well, which is they're all left out. They just, you know, have two or three weeks and they go back to go back to work. They want to stay with their kid. They want to they want to look after them, especially during the first few months. So you're having a system where you're funneling uh, as often the fathers back into work and that's leaving the mothers um, by themselves. Uh, looking after the kid and then possibly having a lot of the um, implications that that causes then they after about a year they are they are losing their maternity pay that they get so then they have a force back to go to to work and then they the child gets passed around to other uh, relatives friends possible childcare. you know the disruption there the the, the development there in in terms of the children's brains which we all know in the two or three years is really important for them to be with their parents so Mm -hmm. all that developmental side of it is just completely all backward really and on a conservative point of view as well there's the the traditional idea about a a conservative family and looking after the children well you by allows you to do that allows the parents to be with their child and look after their child so that's that's another possible hook into appealing to more conservative minded people who oh, want to look yeah. after their families and be traditional. So, <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, is like, okay, like conservatives talk about like no abortions and stuff, but what about after when the person is born? And then it's like, Oh, okay. Nobody cares. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty crazy. You know, it, it, it's, I mean, like, it's like Ariel, if life. you zoom out, it didn't always, it wasn't always that way. We we're living in the aftermath of many campaigns that, perverted and politicized American religion and especially American Christianity. So it's like the vestiges of, of, uh, you know, uh, Christian morality are what we're seeing. It's nothing to do with what the religion was a hundred years ago in America. It's a, it's, it's just this, it's become this completely politicized thing, you know? So that's why it, it, it's so hypocritical. But but now but now we have the internet and we can self teach and practice critical thinking. Not everyone's doing it, obviously. But like we have that ability now. But people without technology, at like good Wi Fi or phones, can't actually access this like knowledge machine at their fingertips. The lose Fedoni. Okay, she's back. Where did I disappear? Am I, st- am I still here? Yeah, yeah, we hear you now. Okay. What, what, what did you hear? <laughs> but now people have the internet, and then we heard you go slow motion. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have the internet now, so we can actually practice critical thinking. We can have uh, it at our fingertips if we are where there's Wi-Fi and internet, right? But if you don't have those things, then you've essentially um, pe- cut people off and put them in the dark ages because they can't even do the research themselves right and, uh, and not to mention just to to hook on to that like getting work uh that now requires you to have these things which cost money yeah. you, you you see like like to get to work like people need you to have an address to maybe have a suit and tie to buy the equipment that some of the work needs what and and if you don't have the income to buy that then you even have trouble getting work so it's like we put people in this chicken and egg situation and it's completely just idiotic and, and yeah. <laughs> well now we have the pandemic so libraries are right. closed which is where they would go for information if they didn't have it right uh and like i mean bathrooms are closed so they can't even go to the bathroom like there's so much closed off that were resources for nomads and i know this first experience because i've had some um emotional days in relation to it to uh, you know and and if i can get riled up over just having to like get kicked out of a place because i'm not allowed to use their bathroom you know because like the homeless are totally 
uh, discriminated against. It's it's so much discrimination. It's like you have no civil rights, uh, and yet people are, are one you know emergency away from being homeless themselves. Yet they continue this perpetuation of uh, discrimination. It's like guys, like we're all on the same team. We need to take care of each other. That person that you just kicked out of the room, maybe they actually have the cure to cancer. I don't know, but if they yeah. die, like you know, why do we have this have- culture of antipathy? Why? Why? It's sick. I don't know. It beats me. Really got to like question a lot of the things that we kind of just assume and take for granted for so many years. Because I mean, the truth is like we're living in a world of like abundance. A lot of farms in this country just throw away their farms are throwing away their food and houses are just going vacant And there are people that are hungry and people don't have any houses. And yet, no, like the market, our God will just guide us with like whatever. And it's like, put that away. Enough. (laughs) It's the false neoliberal chase to satisfy the rich aristocrats instead of increasing affordability and making capital truly efficient. Right. And, and, and if we do a universal basic income, like then, then like maybe it'll help science and space travel and like all these things of the future. Wouldn't you want that as an aristocrat anyway? And it just helps people. So I don't see the downside. It, it's, it's just this like philosophy of like, Oh no, but they're not doing work and money. No, it's is not a philosophy. It's a fallacy. It, yeah. It's fallacy. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like what we said during the campaign, which world do we want to live in, Star Trek or Mad Max? Yes. Well, at least, uh, you know, we got the masks now. So, you know, we're kind of fitting that Mad Max team. You know, we've seen with Facebook and Twitter and social media and it being manipulated and used and abused. Um, so it's a great tool, but somehow it needs to be, um, you know, it needs to be looked after and, and it needs to be made sure that, that it's not yeah, used as a, a way of almost... Uh, dismantling democracy um and that's what i think is, is currently underway so i always say that like facebook and twitter with the echo chambers that we're in and the bubbles we sh- they should almost feed in you opposite views and every fifth post or something should be something that you really i just don't like at all and right. that is completely against you and they know that they've got the data where they can say you are on this side and this is your opposite side just chuck in the the odd post and then you'll be oh dear maybe that's their minds martin um, <laughs> in uh, in America, uh, there's uh, someone who was inspired by Andrew Yang's uh, uh, data dividend. He actually made something very equivalent to Facebook, uh, where it actually pays you for your data that it collects, right? Wow. So it would be a proof of concept for him, uh, for and for anybody who joins it. It's called Fray dot World, uh, F R A Y dot World, and you know, like uh, it's in its beginning stages, but I guess like what he's part of the gang gang and he's open for suggestions on evolving it for the people so that people can get money for it and like we don't um it's so new right it's like only on android for the phone but you can get on uh apple through the website right but like the thing is uh these dreams would flourish more if they had more resources going into them well baby ideas like this uh they grow so slowly because it's all grassroots, right? Like, but with a UBI. <laughs> That's for sure. And, and Martin, what you were saying, this is what's so powerful about our basic income movement. And I reached out to you guys is because like, I think the basic income movement is like, we're the ones who go outside of our echo chambers. We always try to get people, whether they're conservative for Trump, for Bernie, for Biden, or what have you, and we have collected people from all sides of the political spectrum. And, and while, all the, uh, while all these other movements are just in their echo chambers, we're growing and expanding. I just want to put that out there. Thanks, Sheridan has to sign off, so let's let him uh, say goodbye real quick. Sheridan. Uh, Yes, I do have to bounce out. Unfortunately, my life is banging down the door. Uh, Mm. Thank you for having me, Shale. It was wonderful to talk to all you wonderful advocates from the UK. 
uh, be safe. You can find me on Twitter at J Saber Gamer, J S A B E R G A M E R. Have a good day, all. Good. Take care of your life. Let's play payday care, sometime. Right, see you. Okay. Uh, for the UK movement, uh, you guys have um, been around a lot longer than America. I'm, I'm curious um, what, what differences you see from our movement to your guys's. Like, where are the differences at? I'll let Martin speak on this because I've actually only heard about basic income properly kind of just before Christmas. Whereas he's a veteran, even though he's so very young. He's a veteran about this kind of thing. So go, Martin, go. Well, I mean, I've only been involved for the last sort of four or five years, really. Um, but it, it did sort of originate right back into the 70s, really, was when it really kicked off. Um, and there was various different groups, and a lot of the conservatives at the time were, were pushing it. And there was a possibility of, mm. of um, it being implemented. And I think it was the same in America, actually. I, I think it was Nixon, maybe, who was contemplating putting it in this one as a... As a, uh, or or came a vote close or something like that. So, I mean, there's that big history and the Citizens Basic Income Trust was set up um, and they've done a lot of really, really good work. Uh, but it's mainly, I think, the problem is it's been a very academic sort of um, reserved thing that people have been looking at too. People who have been economists and the policymakers who are very much uh, a one section of the of the economic uh, sort of thought uh, class, really. Most of them have been like neoliberal or, or maybe looking at that side of the politics or completely the other way, it's sort of left wing and looking at more distributive and socialist sort of ideas. But there's been a very, very few sort of small people who have been doing this academic research. And but it's mainly just been confined to them, to that little silo. Um, and it's been on for a long, long time. Um, and it's only really broke through in the last few years. And uh, I think... Um, Yang, with the UBI lab network that's all been set up, for some reason, whether it's just after years of austerity that finally something's clicked, um, it sort of has just seemed to come together in the last few years. Um, so I don't really know how, why that's come together, but that seems to be what's happened. So I think reserved, confined to an academic area, and it's only really broke out in the last few years. So uh, I think, yes, we've had some background there, but I don't think that you're that far behind. And in fact, with the Yang um, sort of campaign, in fact, I think you've probably got more people spread across the whole country and you know people who are really, really, really mobilised and really engaged and are committing their life to this, where us in the UK, where we're continuing very much a bit along the sort of campaign-y, um, you know, we will try and get MPs to sign up and we will try and lobby Parliament to do something, I think, uh, and we'll do academic research and policy stuff. That's sort of, we're still a bit stuck in that. And how can we break out into the community organising and getting that and talking to, to real people is a stage that I think you are further ahead than us on. Actually, um, if, oh, if you'd like to trade notes, we would uh, definitely love to help you. You know, um, Humanity First Movement is doing the same thing, but we're still kind of figuring it all out ourselves as well. So we would yeah. love to keep in touch yeah. and make sure that we can, you know, sort of trade tactics and ideas. I think, that can be I think what we need yeah. to do is trade our skills. Okay. Like, you know, if you guys have really great people who are, you know, higher skilled with uh, video making because you've been doing it for a while you know uh, we need mentors in some of this area you know um, Skillshare uh, idea generation think tanks I think this would benefit yeah. us in a way that is probably going to perpetuate us farther because we're uh, working on it and like I mean if we had to fundraise you know like it would be a more powerful message if we're coming from multiple countries even I think you know like, yeah, hey, like hey wake up uh, and I think we need all of that. Uh, and I think if we combine stories from Canada, stories from UK, stories from the US and Kenya, like people would be like, whoa, wait, this is much bigger than I thought. There are way more people organized that I just am uh, behind the curve on, right? Like, oh, this is a thing. But like there's other organizations I think we need to team up with. Um, you know, so uh, any organization that's making a big impact right now uh, is very powerful, especially uh, the reach. If the reach is good, that means their structural uh, tactics are very efficient and we need to uh, replicate that. Right. You know, um, whatever 
whatever we're doing though, we need to learn from other organizations and I think find a lot of mentorship and, or, you know, the right people to talk to. Cause I think, you know, as we expand, we find more teachers, <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, to me, I feel like the, the movement here is in its baby stages yet we're, you know, we got momentum, <laughs> We got some momentum and the stimulus checks that we got uh, really helped prove at least that we could divvy out the money. That was some people are like, where's the money going to come from? Oh, we can't. No, we can. We can spread it out. We figured out where the, a lot of the holes are in our system and where we can improve on. Right. That's going to be this movement, too. And, uh, you know, if we have data to collect and present, you know, maybe we just need to combine that with other forces that are um, uh, magical with this kind of thing, or, you know, uh, stuff like that. Who's your connections? Uh, Who's outside of your echo chamber who could also help out? You know, do you know someone in the film industry that we could talk to? You know, like, could, could we find these things? Because the biggest thing is, it's eyeballs. We need as many eyeballs as we can. I think that's what it boils down to. Um, but if we have eyeballs all over the world, come on, <laughs> we'll be hard to miss, right? Just saying. Yeah. Or as she's, or to sum up what she's saying, we need to build the world's largest uh, coalition and network because when we combine our efforts, we're unstoppable. Yeah, and as well, it's yeah. it, it, you know, humanity first is really, really uh, is a real good message because humanity is you know is, is key to everyone, and it it means that all of these sort of racial biases that people have had and cultural differences and all these traditions, at the end of the day, we're all just humans, and we're all exactly the same. And breaking down then barriers between someone who lives a life as a, as a subsistence farm in Africa and someone who is in China and lives a factory worker and someone who's in in the UK or in America who's working in office or in the financial sector, they're all humans at the end of the day. And that's I think a really really powerful message, and that that pervades everything almost in politics. And that's why I think you've been able to pull people in from all different sides because that is a really really powerful. Powerful thing. I but also going forward, I was just, yeah, well said. Yeah. I was just wondering about what your next steps are, really, because mm. the, the Andrew Yang campaign is great, and whatever happens in the next few months, we'll see. <laughs> um, and good luck, whatever whatever side you want to support in, in, in November. Um, but what happens sort of next year and going forward? Because I think we are thinking about that as well. That we're in a situation that we had our general election last year, and there's not going to be another general election until a few years' time. Who can realistically? change things on a national scale. That's why lots of people are doing lots of local work in terms of local councils like yeah. myself and Maggie and Richard's petition in Brighton um, and Hove and other petitions and other work in other councils across the UK. So I was wondering, you know, are you going to push for more governors and, um, and more mayors? There's some great work that's being done like Stockton. Um, yeah, so what we are doing right now is we're actually trying to get um, UBI advocates elected in all branches of government. So from the Congress down to local mayors, governors, um, city council, you know, basically in every level. And currently we're actually organizing in every state to try and achieve that at the local level. And also um, boost um, understanding of what UBI is, how it works, and really getting the local community activated and acting as sort of a central hub for information. That sounds really good. I know there's fundamental flaws in the American democracy with gerrymandering. You don't say. But uh, it's a bit easier in the UK. We don't have as much as that in this financial fair play and um, in terms of contributions that people can have. So it's, I think we are in a bit of a better situation than that. Um, than you are but but yeah if you can build and use a lot of the sort of community organizing that Barack Obama's campaign sort of really started and and build from the ground is is really powerful but I don't know whether you do lots of door knocking and whether you really you know pound the pound the streets but that also always works in the UK when if you just America's talk to someone... not a walking culture though is it it's a driving no. culture. oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's that's culture. why I don't like I about don't from one house to another and the gerrymandering right. is so extreme and strange here it feels like a lot of the time you're, when you're doing the door knocking, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but it often feels like it is not impactful, but people tell me it is, and people tell me they have a good experience. I don't know, mixed bag over here, different, well, different well, well, 
I mean, yeah, the our district's kind of looking is, at a Rorschach test. I, 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 I was telling some on the podcast, like, we can appeal to uh, Trump's ego for a bit of universe basic income because whatever has his name on whatever has his brand on it and he he it, it's funny because some of our gop uh people are showing more um resistance to just helping people with money than even trump himself and that is so disappointing and and grotesque but 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 sometimes appealing to the ego of uh, Trump and what he has to say, it, it kind of helps. And for, for our cause. And then there's, there, there's also, and the hard thing is about our people running for Congress is that like all of the incumbents have so much money to just drown the, the, their, their co- things in their media, in, in their media. So it's not that people don't agree with the basic income, you know, candidates that were running. It's like, they can't even get reached by them because it takes so much money. So that's, that's a problem that we're trying to work around. Uh, I was just going to say, like, part of the thing is uh, Andrew Yang activated so many people uh, who have never even, I'm one of them, who never even knew much about politics, okay? Like, even the structure of, like, I didn't want to learn about it. I didn't want to pay attention to it. And so right now, a lot of the, the activists that are finally, like, I'm ready – uh, have a learning curve, right? So right now, uh, I think people are learning. Um, I mean, there's people on boards. They've never been on boards before. There's people who are door knocking for the first time, phone banking for the first time. You know, it, it, there's a learning curve to it all. And I think that's like what Yang, when he dropped out, though, people are like, oh, crap, I can't just follow him anymore. I got to do something on my own time. And I think because we activated so many people on an individual level, um, that means we might actually infiltrate our own social networks and reach to our own people because like, that's where one would start if they're brand new to something. But um, you know, it's groups like this where we can talk things out and educate each other uh, that grow the movement quicker because you curb the learning curve. You know? I think most of us here were just activated by Andrew Yang. I'd never done anything other than vote before Andrew Yang. You know, I would vote and I would make the occasional political post on Facebook. Very productive. That's it before Andrew Yang. And then, you know, I did try a little phone banking. Not my thing. So I did this. <laughs> before this Andrew be Yang, right, I, was, I, I was extremely politically active in this country, but it was just like screaming into a void. That, 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 that's what, what it was. I was screaming into a void. Like I, I, I couldn't, like no one was listening, but then after that, it's like, I, I found like, you know, such an amazing community and it, I've never felt better. It's like, yeah. That's the thing. That's the thing too. We finally found each other. Cause I think uh, we are all independently lonely in our own world, uh, drowning on because there was no purpose. There was no purpose for us. And I think nope. because we managed to find each other, we've been um, cheerleaders to each other. You know, we've been the friends. Uh, we're peers. We're coaches. We're mentors. We're, we're everything we've needed to feel happy and secure uh, emotionally to even handle the load because uh, it gave us back some of that mental bandwidth. And, uh, you know, we still have the financial issues, like our whole crew is broke. Okay. We're all broke. We're, we're, we're volunteering our time because that's how much passion we have. And, uh, I think if it wasn't for each other, I don't know how strong we'd be. Mm. Plus, yeah. so not all of us, so. obviously like Jack Dorsey, you know, who's in huge support of UBI. He's definitely not broke. <laughs> well, but, I'm, I'm, Maggie, you've been trying to speak for a while. Maggie, did you have something to say? No, I was just going to endorse what Faye said. You know, we found each other and that's... You We'd like to hear you isolated. speak, though, while we have you. Uh, so it, it's good to sort of reach out, reach out across the ocean and say hi. Yeah. Do you guys have groups like this, like podcast groups that are kind of think tanks? Yeah, I'm not a huge podcast listener, I have to say, but Martin probably listened because he's younger than me. But yeah, certainly there are lots of think tank podcasts. I'm sure, absolutely sure of it. So there's, I think uh, there's probably less so than in America, really. I mean, um, I always see America and people doing podcasts and popping it with YouTube channels and all sorts. And 
um, there's a lot more independent media, a lot more, you know, there's not really that much here. Um, and I do always, I do always think that that um, sort of um, media different channels and people on, on YouTube would be much, much better. And I think that's something that possibly you could help us with. Mm. So maybe if we could feed mm. in with more. Oh, like, we'll be very know. glad to help I, you. I mean, yeah. I'm an audio engineer myself. I, 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 uh, I anything you need with sound, I'll be very happy to talk right. your ear off about it, or, or yeah. just also, to help um, you with help you with sound production because because we've done lots of like webinars and things like that and we've invited speakers along and there's been a lot of stuff on zoom that we've done where you've had um you, know, you invite someone along they speak for 20 minutes or so then there's a question and answer session that sort of stuff that, that that happens but it's only a sort of a, a set event rather than like a, a a regular podcast or a regular um show um so i see people like um i forgot what it's called um the rationalist, rational national or something, rational or something. Anyway, uh, him on YouTube, I see him at the time um, doing a lot of uh, stuff. And But there isn't really people like that in the UK. They always belong to a political party. Mm -hmm. And they're always people like Owen Jones, for example, who writes in The Guardian. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's good. There's a lot of stuff and there's a lot of commentary, but it's political party based. And that independent side and independent streak is, um, is something that really needs to be tapped into because people who there's lots of people who aren't political you know, mm -hmm. in terms of our vote right. share that we have we have sort of 65 percent of people vote generally in our general election that's 35 percent of people don't even vote which is a, in, a sad indictment of the political system that we have that we're not engaging with a third of all people and then that, that is still is, if, if i can jump in real quick 65 percent is fucking massive turnout you guys get 65 percent i mean i in America, we, we, we dream of hitting 65%. <laughs> I'm not sure. Have we ever? Yeah. But in general, it's like in local elections, it can be, you know, 30, 30%, 40%. But, um, but, but yeah, it's better than us too. Sort of what 60% 60, 60 really is what we get in general elections. So, yeah. But even them, 60% of people that do vote, people are holding their nose because there's only a number, a limited number of parties. And it's a worse in America when you've only got two. Really. Yeah, we have a binary. Oh it's God, awful. yeah. And yeah. If you, you see, you see, you know, our binary system leads to uh, po leads to polls like polarization uh, for more for uh, Joe Biden or more against Donald Trump, you know, and vice versa. And they're like the negative uh, energy Ugh, by disgusting. by the math, like you know, more than doubles yeah. the the positive in this election. It's, it's terrible, and it really reflects the actual state of the country, the country, and the culture, and the level. Of, uh, of pessimism and despair or in frustration we're experiencing. It's terrible. Uh, you guys uh, know. Martin. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, that, so our electoral system, say, for example, Martin's part of the Green Party, we have one Green MP. And yeah, how many millions? Martin will know how many millions actually voted Green in the election, but because we're divided up into little areas and it's first past the post system, it's monstrously unfair. So people, as you said, you can't, you know, I would like to vote Green in my area. The green person didn't stand a chance of getting in, so I voted Labour. You know, which I was sort of happy to do, but it's just I would like to vote for who I actually want to vote for, and that for that but, to come. Yeah. Same I understand. Way we feel about, yeah. yeah, if we do that, I, you know, here when I had that conversation with people, they say, you know, it is incumbent upon you, Shale, to vote strategically. You must vote for Joe Biden, or else you're voting for Donald Trump. I'll say no. I just cannot bring it upon myself to vote for the architect of the private prison system we have here. I'm just not a Joe Biden fan in that way. I'm just not a private prison sort of guy. So I'm not going to do it. And they're like, you traitor. You are voting for Trump. No, I'm voting for Howie Hawkins in the Green Party. No, he's not going to win. <laughs> but our system doesn't function if we vote yeah. against a candidate. It is not designed at all systemically to work if we do that. So I'm just going to do... The system, which is a shitty system, but I'm going to use it the way it's intended, at least. And, you know, mm -hmm. that is me doing the right thing, I believe. That's how I respond to people who say, you traitor. If you're not voting yeah. for Joe Biden, you're going to put Trump back in, in the White House. I mean, that's my, my primary is, is that. My secondary is that, is Trump really worse than Biden? You know, it, they're, they're just different monsters. Like Biden is the head of a terrible mafia and uh, and, and Trump is a, a supervillain. Who do you, you know, really? Who's really worse? I'll, may, I don't know. I don't care. Yeah, well, that's why, like, lots of the European countries, I mean, they have, some of them have eight, nine, ten parties, and it's sort of split out seven, some 7%, seven some 12%. But you have to form a coalition and a compromise, um, and you do bring more people in, and all of the, the, the countries that have proportional representation always have a higher turnout because you're bringing more people in. Um, so, but you know, we're far off that because uh, going back to a previous comment made about sort of the, the exporting of different systems, 
you know, Great Britain did export their political system out to lots of countries, and um, America is one of them with sort of electoral colleges and things, uh, you know, voting different ways um, and first past the post system. So, um, as well as the financial sector, it's also d- the democracy that the that the UK has decided to export, and in other countries around the world, with the, the British Empire, former co- former colonies, that you know their their countries often still have remnants of, uh, oh, yeah. of a very antiquated system. It's completely outdated, and uh, it just doesn't suit, um, or it does suit them, and people who want to be corrupt and uh, money launder and do all sorts of other things. Um, oh. But but it's just. Yeah, it's fundamental. I, I'm about- sure that like the elite in the UK and the elite in the US are just like best buddies that like really oh, don't sure. care about the people. You know, like like <laughs> it, it 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 just seems like because like Thatcher and Reagan, they mm-hmm. were like this. I mean, you know, what what are you gonna say? Like, the, well, the, the, Boris uh, is now baby Trump, obviously. <laughs> right, they look like brothers. I mean, like, yeah, he yeah, was born the, in Boris was born in New York. Was he? Yeah, yeah. Although the interesting thing about Boris is what scares me is he is a lot smarter than Trump. He just downplays it. So that's one thing that you know, you guys can say is you have like a mini Trump, but he actually has a brain versus Trump who really just, um, you know, is attracted to shiny objects. <laughs> He's a bath toy out of control. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Right. But by the way, um, did we ever have any like a basic income Canada or UK people on Paget's channel? Because she's like one of our biggest kind of like basic income stars here in the US and she lives near where I do. <laughs> Aside yeah. from her fiance, who's from the UK, oh, yeah. I don't believe so. <laughs> yeah. Although uh, just don't let Paget ever do a UK accent because she's so terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> she, may, she tries to make fun of her fiance. Doesn't, doesn't she have an acting Please. background too? Yes. Yes, yes she, she does. does. Um, and her not, and doesn't do show accents, that she right. wrote and produced, uh, Cat Loves LA, has been go- an ongoing thing uh, up until COVID. But you're always welcome to come on my YouTube channel. I mean, like... I think the, the, the thing is we need to cross over into different people's podcasts because it's like jumping into different yeah. social networks. And uh, people have... We're all a cheat sheet for something, right? We're all experts in something. We have our niches and we're like, yeah, I know. I know all this stuff. And if you have engaging conversations with uh, a plethora of people, especially outside of your social network, um, your impact goes farther. Uh, And if we're directing the conversation back to UBI all the time, I mean... (laughs) It would help. Yeah, we did a bit. (laughs) Well, everything is connected to UBI, yeah. so I think it's okay to drift. And in fact, let me let me ask while I have you. I want to I want to ask if I can indulge you in a quick personal question. That's not not super personal, not, not like a, not for you, but uh, for me. My favorite band and one uh, that that incorporates a lot of um, universal human and primitive sort of themes about like fundamental humanity that sort of seems to be underlying and connecting us in spite of a sort of terrible apocalyptic feeling kind of end stage capitalism we're all experiencing my very favorite band right now is everything everything a band out of manchester i just want to ask if you guys have ever heard of them or know you heard of them i don't know (laughs) cool what everything everything all right that's fair that's Did fine. You, sort of math rock. That's sadly not, unfortunately. That's fair. All right. Well, that was my... Until about the Stone Roses and no. like that. Thank, I will well, thank you, you think for really indulging you. me. I will yield the rest of my time. Well, it's about two hours now. Do we want to yeah. wrap up? I have to go. Oh, we can't end on that now. We have to. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, for, uh, sorry for that. <laughs> thank you both no. for coming. Hey, listen. Oh. Um. You're welcome to come back anytime. And if you'd like to be, we would love to have you as regulars if you have it in you. You say you want to look for an independent podcast like this one. You're more than welcome to join this one. Um, you know, we're always looking for more regulars. Sure. So um, anytime you'd like to come back, just please stay in touch. Uh, are you in, we, we, we mostly coordinate on a, a Twitter a group DM. So if you'd like to join that, more than welcome, please do. Uh, also, we have a Discord We'll definitely be reaching out to you as well. Okay. Our competitions in October time when we're when we're um, when we will go to the council. So if we maybe could come back then after hopefully it's successful. 
Um, and then we would be the, the fifth place in England and the... Yeah. We'll, we'll coordinate a big Twitter hashtag. Twitter. That'd, be, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are really good at Twitter trends. We can pull them off as the Yang gang. We're like, we're so on top of it. have to live in Brighton. They probably do have mm-hmm. to live in the UK, I'm thinking. But. Well, well if, if the people in Brighton don't vote for what you guys stand for, they're probably not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Ariel. Well, thank you for <laughs> just ending it with something, with a joke or like you know, a segment worse yeah. than mine. It <laughs> fell more so, flat. So thank you, Ariel. I would like to say that oh, there's okay. a lot of Yang Gang d- that were active during the campaign um, that are Yang Gang UK. So you may want to search them out as well. They may be um, already with you, or mm-hmm. if they haven't been reactivated, definitely hit them up. Okay. All right, yeah. guys. It's really, really cool oh, you all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you guys. thank you again for coming. It was lovely thank meeting you. you both. I hope to see you again. Right. And thank, thank you, you for much. your work. Thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. Well, thank Bye. you as well. Bye. Yeah. Yep. Bye. Bye, guys.